if our remaining panelists could come join me. We have a man we've heard about already, uh, Brian Ashley, who is the Chief Marketing Officer, I'll, I'll introduce quickly, of uh, Suniva. That's the Atlanta-based... Uh, I'll pause for 30 seconds. That's the Atlanta-based uh, green technology firm that Bruce advertised. I hope Suniva is contributing to your research. Um, uh, then we also have uh, Bradford Jensen, who's a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and a Georgetown professor. He's an expert in trade and its impact on firm performance. Sean Randolph, who is the president of the Bay Area Council Economic Institute. He also has Washington experience. Um, I'm really pleased that he is here because now we've been hearing Bruce talk about cities. We have some people from cities who can speak to that experience. Uh, and then we have an actual mayor, uh, Chuck Reed, who is the mayor of San Jose, uh, and we'll make him maybe also talk about uh, the entire uh, U.S. because he comes from Garden City, Kansas, so he can speak a little <laughs> bit uh, to uh, the heartland as well. Um, I wanted to start... Um, with a question for Brian. Um, I've got to follow up. Fred and Francisco. That's a hard act to follow. Uh, they are a hard act yeah. to follow. Um, but you're actually doing what uh, Bruce would like more U.S. firms to be doing. How have you guys been doing it? Well, first of all, we have a product that people want to buy, and that's important. That's kind of the basics. Uh, and some of that was due to government-funded research and innovation and commercialization because we funded spun out of, which parts of government? the DOE. Uh, for many years, this funded the University Center of Excellence in Photovoltaics at Georgia Tech, and our founder uh, is the director of that center and the founding director of that center. So we, what we were able to do is commercialize uh, public-private partnership very quickly, and from day one, uh, I uh, designed the go-to-market strategy as an exporting company because that's where the market was. And I make a product that uh, turns sunshine into electricity, and there's 600 million people in India that don't have electricity yet. So uh, naturally, uh, we just think that way. Uh, the whole executive team uh, has been in the international business for 25 years. So I think going back to one of Bruce's... And your uh, founder is Indian, right? And our founder is Indian, yes. Uh, in terms a little of bit, uh, a little bit, but I, we already had that that mindset of of exporting the really a borderless business. You go where the market is and where the customers are and where the money is for your product. But first of all, you have to have a product that people want to pay a reasonable price for. Does going where the business is mean you're going to start manufacturing in India? Eventually, we may because right now, India, and this goes to some of our friends in commerce and some of the work I've been doing with them in the ITA right now, and that's fighting domestic content provisions. And right now with their new solar mission, I, I'm in a kind of a unique industry from that standpoint. Uh, they are considering domestic content provisions, which would mean that if we wanted to do business under the provisions and incentives under the mission, we would have to locate a plant there. However, today, as uh, I think Fred mentioned earlier, we send, we make the really high value uh, piece, which is the solar cell itself, which turns sunlight into electricity here in the States. But we have the modules, which you actually put on buildings or out in power fields, et cetera, assembled in India today. Uh, that's kind of a screwdriver technology. It's it's very well done in India or China or one of the developing countries because it's not a lot of high value add there. We do the high value add and we export, and the materials that are used to go in those modules are 90% U.S. content. It's our cells, which is the major value, and then the back sheet is from Matico. The some of the other adhesives and laminates are from our friends at Dow Corning. Uh, Ulbricht makes the ribbon in Tennessee. So most of the components that go into that solar module are actually made in the U.S. And what impact would these domestic content provisions have on you? Well, if they have the, the provisions that go upstream to the cell, then that would really change because what I do is not easy to do, and you have to have absolutely perfect infrastructure. I mean, if I lose power for 30 seconds, I can lose half a million dollars of wafers in a wet bench. So, And you have to have 
the, the engineers, the process engineers, the PhDs, and other people there with deep experience to do it. So it's not easy just to, to throw up a factory and turn a key. You know, it's 18 months to two years to actually do it, to bring it up, we figure, in, in an in a environment with an infrastructure like India. So, yeah, it could really drastically affect our business there if they do this and put this into effect. So we're working with, with Francisco's people and Secretary Locke's people right now to fight that. This connection between, you know, this, this cluster idea, this connection between government-led research and industry obviously is something you guys are very familiar with. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the broader Bay Area experience of that? I'll let Sean do that. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think the, the, the Brookings report goes very well into this subject, that it's not purely a question of the f facilitating mechanisms to help companies find partners overseas, extremely important, but at the end of the day, you actually have to produce something people want to buy. And there's a manufacturing process there, and that gets you into manufacturing policy. You've got to make something to sell it, or you have to produce something to sell it if it's a service. But a lot of the highest value uh, content we saw from the U.S., as we were just hearing, is really technology-intensive, research-intensive. Uh, we may be able to assemble a lot of things, but pure economics may dictate a lot of the basic assembly is best done overseas. However, the things that produce the high-value jobs, uh, the really high-value products, we, we excel in those things. And that goes back to R&D. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, especially in Silicon Valley, uh, a lot of what we produce is technology. Uh, it's everything in IT. Uh, it's nanotech. It's biotech and biopharma. It's medical devices. Very R&D intensive. So that goes to the investment that private companies make in R&D, and we've been very happy to see that over, even over the worst of the recession, our companies have continued to invest in a sustained way in R&D because they are really positioning themselves for a recovery as it comes to be well positioned to take advantage of those markets domestic and overseas. But there is an important federal role in that. A lot of basic fundamental research is done at the federal level. It's really hard for a company that needs near-term returns to focus on those long, 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 long-term investments. And so uh, the role of the federal government is very, very important, especially in things as we were hearing like energy R&D, clean tech, uh, very fundamental part of that value chain that's going to help us produce those high-value exports. Is there enough? Are you worried that American government investment in research is falling behind? It's been an issue for some years. We had, what, four years ago, six years ago, I guess for the America Competes Act, it was an authorization, uh, among other things, to try to ramp up federal R&D. There was the National Academy of Science had a... a, a an, al an alarm that just a minute, we, are, we lead the world in R&D, but in fact, other countries are investing a lot more, and we risk losing our edge because of that. Uh, it wasn't really acted on as an appropriation, but uh, the Obama administration did act on it as part of the whole stimulus package, and I think we're looking now at a reauthorization. That's running out, right? That stimulus will run out. We are going to have to reauthorize the America Competes Act, and then we are going to have to actually appropriate. So there is a debate about, and it's a legitimate one, whether investing in more PhD scientists is enough. It's probably not enough, but I think there's no question when we look at what's happening around the world, in Europe, of course, but in China, many, many other countries that are, are really investing very, very intensely in, in their R&D base, expecting there will be commercial returns on that over time, uh, we probably aren't uh, investing as much as we could. And, and I think even though we've made great progress the last two or three years, especially in energy, uh, this is a huge and growing area. Uh, we could be investing a lot more than we are in uh, helping to develop the technological underpinnings for a, a very aggressive uh, clean tech sector and clean tech exports. And isn't it actually likely that government, federal government spending will fall? There's a budgetary crisis. You guys are in California. I don't need to talk to you about uh, government budget crises. And that sort of anxiety is going to increase at the federal level. It sounds great, you know, to follow Bruce's ideas about more government-led investment in innovation. Aren't the politics uh, militating against that? Well, I, I, I don't think it should or necessarily has to fall in, in basic science. 
uh, and applied science. And I think there is a question out there, too, federal laboratories. We have five of those in, in Northern California. There's many more all around the country that are doing a lot of basic research. They could be reoriented more than they are toward the connection between the basic research and the business community and small businesses and how that fundamental research, it's hard to develop as even a big company, much less a small one, how that gets connected into the business community, how it gets licensed and turned into products. So that's one area where you don't have to be investing a lot more money, although we probably should in the basic research, but we could do a much better job in, in seeing how that technology is commercialized and eventually sold abroad. Chuck, uh, Bruce has given you a starring role uh, and cities a starring role. Do you want that? Is he right? Do you want more of a federal connection with mayors, with cities in pushing U.S. exports? I think Bruce is, and the uh, reporter act absolutely are right about the necessity of uh, a broader collaboration on these issues. There's a lot of things we can do at the metropolitan area. San Jose, uh, as identified in the report, is the number one on the list in terms of percentage of uh, workforce in the export business, and we're eighth overall in terms of, of the jobs. But uh, there is no doubt that the federal government, uh, monetary policy has already been mentioned, uh, tax policy, uh, deferral of tax on foreign earnings, immigration policy, and other other federal level policies have a huge impact on our ability to export and expand, even though our companies, many of them, uh, have foreign born founders and they sort of grow up with the idea of exporting. That's just part of their business plan. It's not an add on. Uh, federal impact is huge. And I think we as mayors have to start thinking about Washington in a different way. We, we typically come here looking for money, earmarks, you know, the usual. Uh, well, that's just the way it is. This is where the money is. They print it here, you know. Uh, we have to think about the monetary policy. And we have to think about deferral of tax on foreign earnings. And we have to be engaged with our business community on those issues to facilitate the export. Uh, because if you want to maintain uh, double-digit growth in your company, you're going to have to export. You're not going to find that kind of growth typically in the U.S. with the maturing of our market. And our companies that are focused on growing are exporters. So what's on your wish list from Washington? Take monetary policy, take tax, take immigration. You're uh, here in Washington. Tell them what you want. The, the number one thing for our Silicon Valley companies who are exporters and who are growing and who are hiring people, even during the recession, is uh, don't make it worse. Uh, don't change the policy on deferral of tax on foreign earnings. Uh, if you're going to do a tax policy change, do it in a comprehensive way, not just to pay for something, but to look at the impact because uh, we would have a dramatic uh, negative impact on the companies that are exporting and creating jobs by changing that uh, def deferral of tax uh, level. It wouldn't but, mean that companies bring the jobs home? No, it would not mean that companies would bring the jobs home. It would mean that companies would start investing overseas and all the jobs would be created overseas and would probably cut uh, jobs in the U.S. Uh, based on our survey of our local companies. Uh, that one p tax policy change alone would have a, a dramatic negative impact on not only our ability to export but the creation of jobs in the U.S. Of course, monetary policy has been mentioned, and, uh, you know, that's way above my pay grade. But, you know, I have to be engaged as a mayor in that with my companies. Immigration And policy. do you have in mind particularly China? Is that what are you hearing from your companies? Well, we know what, that we, have to, we have to compete with China, and not only do the Chinese companies pay a lot less in taxes if we're competing with them, and that, that gets back to the deferral issue, that's an issue, but they're financing their ability, and uh, the exchange rates uh, give them an advantage in selling products to the world. And I'm particularly concerned about uh, the renewable energy sector that's uh, growing. It's one of our key key clusters is that while the, you know, the Obama administration is rightfully so uh, put a lot of money into clean technology, we may have a lot of that deployed with foreign-made products uh, because of some of the advantages that, that China and other countries have over our, our companies. And finally, immigration. Immigration. Uh, Forty percent of the people in San Jose are foreign-born. Uh, more than half of our tech sector companies have uh, foreign-born founders. And uh, our Silicon Valley companies that are growing think that if you graduate from a U.S. university, you should get a green card stapled to your diploma because those folks stay here and create jobs here and create companies here. And you just have to look at the, the growth uh, industries over the last uh, couple of decades. You can, you can see that. But our immigration policy, if it starts pushing those folks back to their countries, especially now that there are a lot of opportunities in India, China, uh, Brazil, you push those people back to the companies, they're going to start 
in those countries, they're going to start their companies there and not here, and we're going to see a, a, a big difference in the job growth. So the immigration policy is really important. Are you worried about the actions in Arizona? Is that going to have a chilling effect for you? No, I, we're trying to take advantage of the actions in Arizona by uh, demonstrating that's why you should locate your company in uh, California. <laughs> Is that going to work, or are you worried that it will make potential immigrants think the U.S. isn't such a great place to be? Let's let's go, let's go to Canada instead. They like immigrants there. Uh, I'm not worried about that. The U.S. is the best place in the world. Uh, Silicon Valley is the center of, of the world innovation, and it's created by the fact that people come from all over the world. That is something no place else in the world can replicate the way that the United States does. It's one of our huge advantages. It's a huge advantage for Silicon Valley. And so what would you like to see on immigration? happen? Well, More we green need, cards for university graduates? All of the issues that are on the table for immigration, uh, the, the key one for Silicon Valley is you know, everything, but really it, it is about the people who want to come here and start companies, who go to uh, universities, and we want to stay here uh, to help uh, create uh, new companies. That's number one. The rest of immigration policy is important as well, and we understand that you know, we may have to have a comprehensive package, but there are key issues that we would like to move ahead more quickly, but pretty much impossible to move without comprehensive reform. And are you seeing this Arizona effect yet, or is that just something you're talking about? Well, we're talking about it. I'm not seeing much. It hasn't, the law hasn't been in effect that long. It's impossible to tell the impact. Arizona has some competitive advantages over California, and uh, you know we have to overcome those as well as this. But it, it's an opportunity for us to talk to companies about why you might want to be in California instead of Arizona. What's your verdict on the report and on what these guys are doing? I, I applaud the authors of the report. I think that it highlights uh, a great opportunity in the United States. I think the aggregate trade numbers, the aggregate trade picture tends to make people very anxious. Uh, a lot of that is driven by macroeconomic effects, uh, which is always hard to talk about when you talk with local and regional leaders. Uh, or business people, uh, that it's driven by savings and investment imbalances. That's the economist is always a cold, wet blanket. Um, but exchange rates matter. Uh, foreign growth matters. Uh, and research that I've done that looked at kind of the last export boom that we had that was the late 80s and early 90s, we saw that exchange rates and foreign income growth were big drivers of U.S. export growth. Uh, at that period, much greater than productivity growth at individual firms. So getting the macro picture right is very important. Uh, that's where our, the colleagues from the federal government have to get that part right. Uh, at the local and, and, and the main macro issue you're worried about right now is the renminbi? Is that, does it all uh, come down I, I to mean, China exchange rate? I think that there are a, a suite of issues. Uh, the, the fiscal balances within the United States both at the federal level, the state levels. At the personal level, we need to save more. We need to spend less. So that's one thing. That feeds, you know, it's kind of the yin and the yang of the Chinese savings glut. That feeds into the renminbi issue. So I think those are all kind of part and parcel of one piece. Uh, we need to adjust our behavior. We need them to adjust their behavior. Uh, that will help U.S. exports. Um, at the local, at the industry level, I think we need to remember that we do have great companies. We have globally competitive companies. The U.S. Uh, retains comparative advantage in many activities. This is a high-skill place. We have comparative advantage. We still export high-skill, innovation-intensive products. And I want to applaud the authors for highlighting services. I think services are too often overlooked in the conversation about exports. Uh, the service sector, if you look at just the professional service sector. In, in geek speak, this is the NAICS 50s, right? It's the information sector, it's finance insurance, real estate, professional scientific and technical services, and administrative support services. Just though it's, it sounds kind of specialized, but in terms of employment, it's two and a half times the size of the manufacturing sector. Okay, so we need to pay attention to this sector. People say, oh, these service jobs, they're not good jobs. The average wage in the service in this business service sector is, uh, you know, 20% higher than the average wage in the manufacturing. Don't 
don't hold me to that. It's somewhere in that 20 to 40 percent range, better than the average wage in the manufacturing sector. So these service jobs are good jobs, and these are tradable activities. You know, in that big cluster, more than half of the jobs, and those are in industries or occupations that look tradable within the United States. And the firms that participate, we, we, we've heard about the 1% of firms, of all firms that export. That sounds like a very low number, and it is. But remember, we're including in that count of firms dry cleaners and uh, pharmacies and all things that you might not think should be exporting, right? If we look at the manufacturing sector, maybe 20 to 25% of firms export. That's still low. If we look at service producers, it's only 1 in 20. Okay, even in these tradable service activities, it's only 1 in 20. So the big question is why? Why isn't there more services, uh, more exports from the service sector? And I applaud the authors for, for highlighting services as part of the puzzle here. And I, and I think that listening to local leaders, uh, they are engaged on services as well. And what about the, you know, bringing the metros, bringing the mayors more into the relationship with the federal government. Is, is that important? Um, I think we don't understand the process by which firms come to export. Uh, again, a number that was mentioned this morning was uh, of, of the exporters, of that small number of firms that exports, only half export to more than one country. In fact, in, in research that we've done, it's 40% of exporters only export one product to one country. I mean, it's kind of stunning. It's why don't we see these firms exporting at least more products to the same country or the same product to more countries? Why is it? What are the impediments? And I don't, the research community, Bruce said, you know, we need to, we need to do more research. We do. We don't really understand what these impediments are. What, what are the sunk costs? What are the, what are the trade, what are the barriers to firms engaging? Do you have a guess? What's your, what's your theory? Um, I, I think that the sunk costs are big. You know, there are big information costs. It's a big effort to enter a new market. I think to the extent that government policy, uh, the types of agencies, the XM Bank, ITA, the Federal Commercial Service, uh, to the extent that they can provide information to all firms and to reduce the information costs of entering a new market, help make connections to distributors, help make connections to consume, you know, to, to uh Consumer customers um, that will enable more firms to participate in the global economy. So, Brian, Agreed. I think you just are exporting to one market. Is that right? Oh no, I export Africa. You're all over Europe, even China. Uh, I export to China, which is unusual. And my main competitors are Chinese, of course. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're a global exporter, but. I, I wanted to comment on something the mayor said, and I totally agree with you on the green card staple to especially advanced degrees because uh, we can't find process engineers to hire. We're not graduating enough engineers, indigenous engineers right now, people in science and math and high, high science, electrical engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And so we need to keep a lot of those smart people from Asia and elsewhere and Africa uh, that are getting those advanced degrees and, and, and really try to incent them to stay here because unfortunately, we're not graduating them ourselves. Uh, we're, we're, we're educating the rest of the world, the best universities and the best research universities, but most of them aren't Native American uh, people. Uh, another is there, is there a chilling moment happening right now? Do you think that people from outside the United States are feeling that America is less welcoming? Uh, no, I, I don't see that. It's uh, A lot of people come here and they spend eight years here getting a degree and some of them are just ready to go back home. And there are many other opportunities, as the mayor mentioned, back in the developing world for them now. And they can have a much better standard of living actually there, making even less money than they would make here. They could still live like kings and queens uh, there to a certain degree. So I, I think that's some of it. I don't, I don't think they don't feel welcome. If we made it easier for them, though, it certainly would help and make it more of a natural, well, you are going to stay here, right, and, and, and take advantage of 
of all the uh, the opportunities that are here. But Do you think business hasn't been speaking out loudly enough in favor of immigration reform and of a more open immigration policy? You hear a lot of voices on the other side of the debate. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not that close to it other than the, than the factors that I just mentioned, of course. Uh, there's a whole raft of other thorny political issues in Arizona and elsewhere. And maybe that's why some people haven't, because they didn't want to get embroiled or sucked into the other part of the conversation. But I definitely agree with the, the point earlier. And, and one other point I wanted to make about and touch a little bit on the fringes of industrial policy and not a command and control industrial policy. But we're not competitive with the rest of the world in helping industries, especially key industries, be competitive. My competitors in China, one last week, got a billion dollar loan from the government at no interest rate. They get Fred's another gone. one got Too bad. three billion dollar loan guarantees uh, to build capacity. And the name of the game is capacity. The bigger capacity you have, the more scale you have, the lower your manufacturing cost. We're not doing that here. We're trying to build a second plant. Right now, I'm sold out. I'm turning away customers in India and China and Europe every day because my capacity, I'm at capacity. We're trying to get a DOE loan guarantee now to build a second plant in Saginaw, Michigan, as Bruce mentioned. It's taken since last September when we put the thing in. It's going to take another year. Why, why, why do you need the government? Well, because right now, to, to compete with free money, our competitors are getting a loan guarantee. We're not asking for money from the government, but the loan guarantee program is a great way that the government doesn't have to shell out the money, but at the same time enable us to get much more favorable interest rates and less onerous terms, which banks are charging right now in this environment. Banks are still holding us up. Uh, and, and financing is key, especially for a very capital-intensive industry like ours is. You know, uh, so that to be competitive, we need that. I can go to Malaysia and they'll give us the money to build the plant. Are you going to do that? No, we'd rather do it here, but we'll see what happens. I'm turning customers away every day, and I don't want to do that. I could triple my exports the rest of the year if I had that new plant. If I could add on, on, on the visa point and, and on the service point, too, that one of the major reasons that companies these days locate where they locate domestically or internationally, isn't as much the cost of production, although that can be a factor, but it's the human capital pool. Can they find the right kind of people Absolutely. to get the job done? And that's becoming really the arbiter of a lot of uh, competition policy. So if we can't get the people we need in to produce what we need here, whether it's the entrepreneurs with graduate degrees for starting companies or people with very specific skills our companies need, then that's just going to have the perverse effect, I think, of, of adding to pressure to push that production offshore, where you can easily access those pools. So it, it's been a tough one, though, in immigration policy because it gets tied up with the entire debate. You know, Arizona came up about illegals coming in from Central America and, and Mexico, which is a, really a totally different issue. But it's been very hard Do you think there needs to be more differentiation between the unskilled and the highly skilled immigrants? I think they need to be disaggregated. There's a lot of pressure, and I think the call on Capitol Hill now is comprehensive reform. You can't do anything unless you solve everything. And there's a logic that, on the other hand, these issues are very discreet. They have very specific impacts. They have almost no relation to each other, and they really should be disaggregated. Um, the other, on, on services, I, I think it was a really important point because just to take as an example of architects, uh, a lot, it's, it's amazing the number of architectural and urban planning firms I encounter in California, especially the Bay Area, who are now getting a major share, 20, 30, 40 percent of their total revenue from overseas. Yep. Uh, and it's been a counter-cyclical business. I first started to meet these people back in the big recession in 93, and they were starting to go overseas when building really plummeted then. Uh, the recession in 2001-2, they started to focus more overseas. And, of course, now, certainly in California, people aren't building very much at all. But the, these, these cyclical waves of long periods of very little construction or design activity has led a lot of our architects and planners to look overseas. And now... I'd say the biggest market right now is China, but other places in Asia as well where they are literally designing entire sections or you know, 30, 40 square miles of cities, urban waterfronts, the tallest building in, in Shanghai, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think 
And these aren't all big global architectural firms. There are remarkably 10, 20, 30 architects who are actually finding that if they partner properly overseas, they're, they're doing terrific business, and it's, it's uh, countervailing the slowdown here. And, and we're probably not measuring any of that. No, no, it's very hard to I capture. I mean, to, to the point on data, uh, on the good side, we have, we have fantastic data that the, that the Census Bureau puts out. But on the services side, we're just not measuring any of that. No. I mean, they're, they're woefully inadequate. Chuck, I'd like to hear your thoughts on Brian's point about it would be nice if the government gave American exporters a little bit more of a hand, especially with some juicy interest-free loans. Uh, is that something? Loan guarantees. No. Loan, oh, loan guarantees. Loan guarantees. Yeah. I have 10 uh, companies in San Jose that are waiting for uh, Department of Energy loan guarantees. Uh, some of them have sold out their production for multiple years. And uh, in the uh, renewable energy sector, in particular, uh, that is going to be vital to expanding our capacity and uh, meeting those uh, world markets because we have the technology. It's been developed here. Uh, we have the uh, in San Jose alone. We have the producer of the world's uh, most efficient solar cell, the producer of the world's most cost-effective solar cell, the producer of the world's highest concentrator solar cell. All of this stuff has come, you know, not just in California but in, in Georgia and elsewhere. And uh, we're going to sell that technology to the world, but uh, the manufacturing could well be done elsewhere. And that's why the DOE loan guarantees are really important. So there's an area where the federal government could play a huge role in making it possible for us to manufacture the materials here and sell it uh, overseas. And is this a bottleneck bureaucracy problem, or do Uh, programs not exist? Because it sounds as if you're waiting for approval. You have 10 companies waiting for approval. We submitted the first application in the previous administration, and the program really wasn't designed to really give out the loan guarantees, to be honest with you. But well, it, it has was, been it fixed. It was designed to have people write about it? Yeah, yeah, and spend three or $400,000 to, to submit applications like we did, and then nothing would happen. That, that has been fixed. Uh, we submitted last September. It's going to take another year before the due diligence is finished, and we'll spend a million dollars on consultants to help them with their due diligence. It's not like we're, we're not exotic new technology. It's proven stuff that works, and we've proven we can build a plan and do this and make it work. But it's the bureaucracy, and we're working on that right now. And, and you know, if we're going to be competitive, China can turn around in 30, 40 days and actually give the loan, not just a loan guarantee or a loan guarantee, and other countries as well. I'm not, it's not just China. But to, to help industry-leading companies, it's vital to compete worldwide and be an exporter, to have that quick and less expensive. Do you, do you buy that, Chuck? Is that the experience of your companies? Well, let me say that the Obama administration has vastly improved in this yes. particular area over what it was in the previous in administration. The particular being Department of Energy. Department of Energy and Loan Guarantees. Vastly improved, vastly got greater capacity, but they really had to build the program from almost from scratch with the stimulus uh, package uh, started. So I'm not going to compl- complain about that. I just want to point out that our companies who are looking at these kind of loan guarantees are also looking at other places in the world, not just in China. We're not just giving them loan guarantees. They're giving them money. Yeah. to come build their factory point. there. And every one of these companies that will be exporting has the opportunity to go to other countries and build those manufacturing facilities and do it there. They want to stay in the U.S. for a lot of reasons. They want to be close to their technology. They want the innovation of production to be close together. The people here, the human capital is here. But it is a hugely competitive uh, global marketplace, and it's not just company to company. It is government to government that's competing, and there are many ways that other go- governments are doing much more uh, than our federal government is currently capable of doing. Should the U.S. government be doing more? Yes. What, more loan guarantees, the actual loan guarantees loans? Is, loan guarantees I mean, is a great one, Export Import Bank. These are all good programs. I think the expansion and the focus on export that the president has laid out will, I think, lead to that. Uh, but you just have to look around the world, look at what other countries are doing, and realizing that, wow, it's just really tough to compete with these uh, other uh, countries in terms of locating those manufacturing facilities. In particular, the innovation, the technology, innovation in Silicon Valley, innovation in the U.S. will continue, and that's important. But if we're talking about trying to create the jobs, especially in manufacturing, that's where we uh, are at a competitive disadvantage with other uh, governments. Uh, Renewable energy is an area where we can manufacture. We have companies who spend $50 million on a building and $100 million on the machinery to go in those buildings to pump out uh, you know, 
renewable energy, uh, particularly in, in solar. Mm -hmm. Low percentage of labor in that product allows them to manufacture in the U.S., but when you have other countries offering them free money to come build in their country, it's, it's tough to turn that down. And are you confident these government programs, these loan guarantee programs you're talking about, also government investment in R&D is going to survive the coming sort of budget hawkishness, which it seems pretty certain we're moving into certainly next year? I think we have to worry about all of that. And if I look at the, the companies that are growing and, and building, some of them are spinoffs from the uh, NASA Mars program. And uh, some of them are spinoffs from other federal programs. And the, the federal relationship to innovation is not as well known as it should be. And you can look back over the last couple of decades where federal money has gone into innovation that's creating products today. And if we stop that federal flow, we may not notice it for a year or two, maybe a decade. But by then, it's way late. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. Oh, I'll and add one, if, one point on... on uh, let's just everybody get ready for your questions, please, because we're coming to an end, and please go for it. Uh, on, on, the, on the scale of what we do, uh, just one case study, and my numbers are going to be wrong, so don't cite them or anything, but uh, the, the U.S., um, Lucky and Martin just lost a, a, a mega deal to a French consortium uh, for the, the Iridium deal, which is this big mega global uh, satellite system. It's probably the biggest satellite telecom deal in 10 years. Um, and the French government came in in a very timely way with, I think it was a 100% loan guarantee. And I think XM wasn't able to get a bid in, in time to compete with that, but even if it had, it, it could have maybe done 25%. And so, I and think would that have been enough if Exim had been? It's well, it, it too made, bad Fred isn't here. You could have confronted him I would, directly I would have if asked he had him. been yeah. speedier. And the, uh, I'll take what, up for Fred in a minute when he's finished. What, 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 <laughs> I'm, what I'm told is that actually the U.S. Uh, uh, Lockheed Martin was, was very competitive on quality, extremely competitive, and they'd done the previous system, so there was sort of a benefit there. But that um, maybe if we'd come in with a 25% in a timely way, we could have competed, but. The fact that we weren't as timely and the French came in, obviously having made a strategic decision that it was important to France to capture this deal. Uh, many, many thousands of jobs involved in a tough economy for everybody. Uh, I think they made the strategic choice. They're going to do 100% guarantee. So then the cards fall where they, where, where they fall, but some other governments are obviously making very strategic decisions on the importance of these activities that are going to get behind them. Yeah, I was just going to say that, we'll that XM facilities are vitally important as well, and we've used them, and XM has been a great supporter. The, the problem has been, again, like the loan guarantees from DOE, that it's been onerous and long process, an expensive process, and OMB gets involved. Fred, to his credit, since he's come in, the whole team over there is trying very hard to streamline that. And they have, in fact, for the solar industry, they have something called a Solar Express, which is if it's under $10 million, I can do it quicker and they don't have to go through all the. But, but, and it's much is, less is expensive that the to the, the customer. Or are they understaffed? Do we go No, no it, it's, it's, it's systemic. And, and I don't know if that comes from the charter and the law from Congress. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the, the loan guarantees from DOE or if it's legislation that it needs to change that to streamline or not. That would be a great research. <laughs> <Being first. laughs> what is wrong and why, why can't the bureaucracy fix it, even though we have great leaders that want to fix it now. And really, they're banging their head against the wall. Because they're as frustrated as we are. There? They have enough money to disperse. It just takes them too long. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Uh, my name's Tom Ramey, um, and I am a former executive of a Fortune 100 company um, that did and does an awful lot of business overseas. And one of the things that Do has you want to tell us which company? Uh, Liberty Mutual Group. And uh, one of the things that has surprised me about this presentation is that, first of all, uh, and I had a preview of Bruce's uh, presentation before I came, was that it's a frightening presentation. Um, I mean, my view is that um, we should be here, all of us, a little bit panicked and all of us extremely concerned. The two previous speakers, and in fact, I was sitting here thinking, uh, you should have made them stay um, because it was a soft sell. I mean, the XM Bank relative to what you're talking about, how we have to compete. I mean, the amount of money they're dealing with is peanuts. Um, that's first thing. The second thing is that um, from my 
just my own perspective, my company's perspective, is that the usefulness of the State Department, the Commerce Department, um, the array of government institutions is minimal. Um, basically, we know more about what's happening in countries than they do. So I can't imagine what a small and medium enterprise company would do if they were depending on them for resources, particularly in this competitive environment we're talking about. The, the, and can and I just ask you, how about Bruce's suggested metro focus? Well, do you think I, you'd get uh, more purchase at the city level? So I think the most one of the most important slides, or other than those that should scare the hell out of everybody, uh, was the slide that showed the incredible array of government entities dealing with this problem and how there's very little coordination between any of them. Um, the, and the reason why that's important is because the speed of change is such that you can't afford the kind of delays that you're talking about relative to loan guarantees or the array of instruments. Um, and just one last point. The, so this is a statement. This isn't a question. <laughs> if you it's, a good, gathered, it's a good if, statement. It's a good statement. We're all interested. If, if you haven't gathered by now, um, the... Um, I mean, what we haven't talked about is uh, we're, we're graduating less people f with, four co with four years of college uh, degrees. China has a supercomputer uh, that has been developed here uh, in the very recent past, and I, I think we have three in the United States. They have one, uh, and Europe has one or two. I mean, that's just as a measure of the kind of development that's taking place. The immigration policy, the disaggregation of what's, what's really important and what's not is critically important. You're asking if we're too parochial. I think we absolutely are. Our language, our language education is awful. The, for, for me uh, and for our company, we ended up bringing executives together outside the country versus coming into the country because the hassle of coming through customs was so bad. Uh, tax issues are huge. Uh, I mean, they are really huge, and they're getting confused with a bunch of other things that have little to do with our export issues. So in summary, I just I, I wish there were... Um, People were acting more frightened, more concerned, acknowledging the hole that we have and that we were talking about how we have to get more aggressive and how we do it. And I'm not quite sure how we do it in terms of convincing our populace and our government to go about this differently because we are literally, no matter what you say about the status quo right now, we, in effect, are getting our clocks cleaned. Uh, and every day that passes, it gets worse. Um, so... Thank you all. I, I could comment on that for just a moment, maybe from uh, going back to the report itself and the, this metro uh, federal connection and the, and the role of leadership at the local level and, and at the, the, the federal level. That I think in a way we've seen actually, unfortunately, a, in California, a, a regression in, capac in local capacity. Uh, Ten years ago, I, I ran the state's trade program it was the biggest in the country. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. The, the state's trade program was abolished in the last budget crisis in about seven years ago. There were, at that point, I think five World Trade Center associations in California. It's down to about two. Some major cities like San Francisco had a trade specialist on staff. That hasn't been the case for many years. So I think at the local level, at a civic level, local government level, we've seen actually in a state level, we've seen a pullback and I think a lot of state level programs that were fairly well empowered, those have all shrunk in recent years with state budget crises too. Um, we've seen, on the other hand, other more business-based groups, I think, stepping up. Our, our, our own group has been focusing on, on publishing, on, on exports in the area in, in Northern California and why they're important and what the issues are for exporters and where the export support resources are. We've, we've been publishing on the, the business and economic ties with major countries like China and like India, trying to identify opportunities there. And then we've, we've taken three conferences in, in clean tech and venture capital to China. We opened an office in Shanghai, full-time office. Is that office. good enough to substitute for well, the missing government? No, it's not. It, I, I think what it was pointing to the fact that, that businesses and business-based civic organizations are, to some degree, stepping up and need to step up more aggressively to fill the void, but it's still a void. And here's where we get to the federal level. The 
I, I, I've worked with the U.S. Commercial Service, ITA folks, for years and years, and I think it's an it's a small, underappreciated, but for the most part, very, very effective service for small and medium companies. Big ones don't need it, but small and medium ones, there's a lot of expertise on the ground. So it's good to see in the President's Export Initiative that more resources are going to be put that way. And, and the fact is, in a lot of our metro areas, it's really only the U.S. Commercial Service offices that anchor any activity now. Uh, they're really, they have more expertise than anywhere else. In California, we have 13 what we call Centers for International Trade Development to help really small, new-to-export people uh, through community colleges. That's down to five this year because of the budget crisis. And so really, I think a lot of these metro areas, especially in California, are having to look more and more to the federal resources, the U.S. Commercial Service, as the anchor for real expertise at the urban metro but level. But isn't there, isn't there a bit of a contradiction in what we've been hearing which is, on the one hand, we need more government support. We need more actual civil servants working on these issues. We need more loan guarantees. But, God forbid, we don't want more taxes. So if the exporters don't want to pay the taxes for these services, I don't see other parts of America putting their hands up and volunteering. Well, some of the services for well, the U.S. commercial service services are... They, I don't think they pay for themselves entirely, but they're, they are fee-based services, and there has been studies done in the past that say that the taxes generated on the business growth from the exports pays for those services anyway. But I think what, what this is calling for, though, is a tighter partnership, which is also in Bruce's report, between the federal services and local cities and business groups, really more of a coalition at the urban metro level between business, local government, federal services, and states to really develop localized, concentrated strategies. And on that, I, I wouldn't want this to end without one important point, which is a federal one. It's federal trade data. So it's really hard to get across to local governments, to your Congress members, to your mayors and city council people, why it's important to focus on this if there's no data. Okay, that's so, probably where Bruce can wave his report around and say that's part of the reason thing. he's done it, right? It's very valuable. We, there used to be a data series called the Export Location Series that tried to trace it to where the, the company where it was located that exported. Now it's a it's an origin of movement, so it's where it was shipped from. That's different. But at the end of the day, it's really hard to get congressional support for trade agreements, for trade services. It's hard to get cities and counties and states and others focused on why it's important if there's no data that says, here's how you're benefiting, here are the companies in your district that are exporting, here are the jobs that are being generated, here's the tax base you're getting from this activity. So I think this really needs some work at the federal level. Will you gentlemen permit me to go to the next question? Is that okay? No you're in charge. Responses? Yep, go. Okay, please. Uh, my name is Arthur Huang from the Center for Clean Air Policy. And in the realm of transportation and land use, there have been a lot of dialogues and programs on smart growth type of um, development for our city, cities. Um, ideas include high-density, transit-oriented development, impro improving accessibility for all modes of transportation and for our communities. Um, and these programs are designed to improve um, livability for our residents. So I want to ask our panelists, how do you think these urban policies might be related with the cluster strategy that Bruce talked about? And, and how would that contribute to the prospect of U.S. export, if any? And what kind of programs that you guys think we should design to associate these goals you know, together you know, and, and ultimately improve the competitiveness of our nation? Thank you. Maybe I'll ask Chuck and Brian to respond. Well, we certainly spend a lot of time talking about smart growth as a uh, basic approach to dealing with uh, not having enough land, not having enough transportation infrastructure, not having enough of uh, everything you need for continued population growth and being able, being able to accommodate that. And we certainly focus uh, that a lot in uh, San Jose and the Bay Area in particular. Uh, ultimately, I think what it means is being able to be more efficient in the use of uh, people and, and land, which will help us uh, be more competitive in the world market. Uh, I don't see it as a, a short-run impact 
on the, the problems that we're facing in the export market at this point. But in the, in the long run, being more efficient is important because we do have to compete on price, even though uh, at the commodity end, we're not very good at competing on price, but there are many, many products where price will be very important. And how about you, Brian? Is yeah. making Atlanta livable and appealing important for you to attract people? Well, to well sure it is. And, and other incentives for business and tax abatements and everything else, that's important too. I mean, that's how you choose a location. Uh, as well as the clusters uh, concept. So all those things come into effect. And another comment is that that's something that pays for itself. If you attract the industry, you get more tax base, you get more people paying taxes, you get more residents making better wages. And, and the same thing could be said about the investment that I mentioned earlier. This country is far behind the rest of the world, as the gentleman mentioned in the audience. It will pay for itself. We're going to be in a lot worse shape if we don't spend the money on the loan guarantees and the investment and the innovation, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Mag Diamine. I work for uh, International Finance Corp, part of the World Bank. Um, I, I um, travel around a lot, and it's oftentimes on business trips I can have an entirely sort of U.S.-centric day, even overseas, and staying in a U.S. hotel and having a Starbucks and having a lunch in a, in a U.S. chain and um, watch uh, U.S. content, et cetera, and it's and it's I mean it's hard for me to picture that the U.S. hasn't been adaptive. It's I, I, I could have this day in China, for example, and uh, and on often on, and often do, and I, I think that the U.S. has done a lot. The issue is that it hasn't gone down to second tier cities, and it hasn't hit some of the emerging issues that a lot of countries have. Um, you know, energy, renewable energy is certainly there, but. Uh, water is now increasingly important for a lot of countries. And so um, I think that, you know, as far as the report goes, the agglomeration issue, um, you know, we, we, we did a report a, a year or two years ago on the World Development Report explaining economic development in agglomeration terms. The U.S. was seen as to having already done this. I mean, the, the coasts are already where manufacturing is and the center isn't, where a lot of countries haven't picked that up. And so for them, it's advice. For here, it's maybe explaining what what has already happened. But um, maybe we need to go look at that from the other side. How, how, do, how do we penetrate the process of agglomeration in other countries? And so I guess really uh, my question is, um, you know, if well, on that line and along the lines of this gentleman that just made comments, what would be the next step of research? How, what would be the advice to Bruce's team as to how do we go a little bit deeper in understanding the process of What's happening in countries and being, you know, linking this agenda a little bit more because a lot of what we heard is really could have been done on purely exports without the metro connection. Here we need to connect it a little bit more, and I, I would just be curious what, what the research advice would be from others. Do you want to try, Bruce? Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of what you're describing is hidden in plain sight in the United States. And I, and I think um, the mayor's comments in particular, um, and Sean's comments as well, sort of talked about a disconnect be between the macro discourse around the economy and the way in which we're actually organized geographically. And, and again, I, I, you know, we, we've sort of drifted here. So yet on the academic side, you know, I would I would probably agree with you in terms of the uh, extensiveness of the research on agglomeration and, and how it's sort of iterated over the past several decades. Um, but it is not affecting until recently the way in which we actually act. So I think this is about taking, um, frankly, the practice in other parts of the world back into the United States. I sort of share Tom's perspective on this, frankly. And I think the most interesting part of this panel and maybe we should have flipped it and have a friend in Francisco stay. But the most interesting part of this panel um, is about uh, the slowness of response. I pity um, the Department of Energy. Yeah, and, I, and again, I, I mean, what we're talking about here is a legacy government that was basically run down for a period of time. And, when I, you know, and this is over a longer period of time. So this is not about the last eight years. This is over several decades, a national government which began to lose capacity bit by bit around these issues of project finance, around issues of export support, and so forth. 
And, and now we're finding ourselves at the tail end of that period, uh, realizing, A, there is demand abroad, there's possibilities abroad, but we don't quite have the capacity to deal at this with the same alacrity or same precision that many of our competitors do, A, and B, we're not making the macro to metro connections. You know, every time I heard Fred and Francisco say the word Saudi Arabia or say the word Indonesia or say the word Brazil, what I thought about was their metros. Because we're not trading with countries. We're trading with other metros and the firms within those metros. I mean, that's where the demand's coming from. So I agree. We have the research, but perhaps because we're a specialized nation and we're a sophisticated economy, we're not really connecting dots between the macro and metro. We've almost given responsibility for certain parts of the economy up here and other parts of the economy down there, and this fragmentation and disconnect is severe. So, you know, macro to metro from our perspective is not, you know, it's, it's a bumper sticker, but within it I think it really um, unveils some, you know, really profound insights of how and, and to, We've we never think, faced the competition you know, that we face now on the world stage. We used to be the big dog on the block, and we're not that anymore. Absolutely. And we're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller unless we change that. So maybe I should rewrite this according to Tom's <laughs> call to arms. <laughs> okay, we have time for just one more question, so please. Hi, uh, I'm Don Jones. I'm with the New Economy Initiative in uh, of southeastern Michigan. So first, uh, coming to Saginaw, if there's anything we can do to help push <laughs> you, DOE, we're <laughs> please, uh, we'll, we're right there with you. Um, some of these questions that have come around, mine comes, I think, at first sounds pretty mundane, um, and to our... Um, mayor and local area, the infrastructure as it relates to uh, supply chain. So we're talking about roads and uh, water and shipping and air and the bad state that our uh, infrastructure in that part. I like to say this, our friends in Canada, as we look to our neighbors to the south, as we say in Detroit, uh, our, our neighbors in Canada, um, it, you know, it is, it is much better. But that, again, the investment in the past has always been thought of as a local investment, you know, there, there's gas tax and such like that, but it's always been sort of a local investment. Fix your roads, work on the railroads, and this kind of thing. Um, so I'd, I guess the question about is um, looking at the national investment in that infrastructure because it's about moving things from one market internally to the next and then overseas, and how do we sort of address that or think about addressing that? Infrastructure is the basic building blocks, and that's why they call it infrastructure. That's why it's so important, because it's really tough to, to build an export economy if you don't have the uh, fundamentals in place for a, com for a company. And those company decisions get made, in many cases, based on infrastructure, because if they're going to manufacture, they've got to export it to someplace, another state or another, another country. And so the, uh, but it's not just all local money. If I look at our infrastructure uh, demands in uh, California and in the Bay Area in particular, there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, state and a lot of federal money, certainly the stimulus uh, uh, funding. The ARA funding has been huge on infrastructure, and we're spending a lot of money that. We've got many applications in for the federal government, and that's part of what local governments traditionally have done. We come to Washington looking for that kind of infrastructure support. Uh, because it's much bigger than we can do on a local level. Even though we are a self-help city, a self-help county, we tax ourselves for infrastructure. It's much bigger than uh, what we can afford to do locally. Bruce was pushing the infrastructure bank. Do you like that idea? Yes, the infrastructure bank is something that we do uh, support uh, because there are many, many projects that we would like to be able to uh, finance and doing it at favorable rates uh, would be very helpful to us. And has the federal stimulus money helped you on infrastructure? Uh, it, I think, again, uh, slow, <laughs> moving very slowly. And, uh, again, with so many needs, I think this, this sort of coordinated policy is what I'm thinking about. There's so many needs. You know, unfortunately, too much of it is sort of Band-Aids again, fixing some things that are just need some uh, desperate help right now, but it's not looking at the whole system. How do we better coordinate it? How do we improve it? What actually is the supply chain that we're interested in? You know, what directions do we want to go? How do we get from the port of Halifax to Detroit to the West Coast? And, 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 and thinking about that in a more coordinated way is just one example. So, yeah, the money's helped, but it's not really, unfortunately, I think as many people know, the uh, – Stimulus dollars, uh, the recovery dollars, were at one level a lot of money, and another level not enough money. Chris, I, I'll just leave this you know, because it's too easy. But, uh, <laughs> um, 
the, the way in which we allocate infrastructure dollars is, is, is really an old-style political reward system. And, and it, you know, at the end of the day, you know, our work basically shows that the U.S. economy is highly concentrated in a particular set of places. If we want to compete abroad, we have got to make the signature transformative investments in L.A., Long Beach, and some of the other major hubs. We're spreading this money like peanut butter all over the country. Um, you know, when I go into a state, I usually just say, how many people in your state Senate and how many people in your state House? And then I can tell you the way you allocate your infrastructure dollars. You know. Well, I think one thing, until fairly recently, we've, we've never really had a, a, a national a goods movement strategy. So a lot of transportation dollars get allocated to a, this city or that town. We're going to repave this road or have this or that on-ramp or off-ramp, which is great. But uh, I think, as, as Bruce is suggesting, looking at uh, the goods movement hubs that, that are the critical gateways into and out of the U.S. for exports, looking at the national transportation network that moves the goods you know, from the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, looking at that in relation to, well, where's the shipping going to be going when, it, when the Panama Canal is widened? Um, are our West Coast ports going to be competitive, and so on and so on. So I think it's a relatively recent idea there would actually be a national strategy for commercial infrastructure, the, the kind of things that actually move the goods. Okay, we have reached noon, and I promised we would be done then. I'm just going to give Bruce uh, two more assignments for your next seminar that have come from this, uh, which are I think you need to extend your research to effectiveness of federal government institutions. That seems to be a theme that we've heard. And maybe you need to do a chapter on immigration. Uh, and uh, I think Tom's point about perhaps uh, alarmism on this subject uh, seemed to resonate with all of us. Uh, usually journalists are the ones being accused of being alarmist, but it sounds like we could be more so. Uh, and I hope you'll join me in thanking our really frank... Thank you. Thank you.